Well, hello there. Welcome back to the Agassino Zinga Show, episode number 326. With me, your host, Agassino. This is episode number 326. How are you feeling? How's it going? Great. Amazing. I've got to be honest, right? Um, I'm kind of fed up with everything. Got to be honest. I'm sure most of you guys are. And girls out there are fed up of just being locked in indoors and having to, you know, entertain yourself with a mirage of netflix shows and youtube stuff and stuff on social i've had enough so much so that i've essentially stopped using social um i periodically check in on twitter here and there because i have a a really good list of people i follow in terms of um covid19 updates you know public intellectuals leading scientists and all that sort of malarkey i check in a couple times a day once in the morning once in the evening to find out what's happening i could probably sell it down to one day in a day one time during the day but for the most part i'm kind of deciding from now on going forward um no more social for me um just want to get back to reading books and watching movies um the world if it ends up imploding <clears throat> there's not really much i can do really you know from where i am um i'm sure there's not much we can do either as global citizens we're not even global citizens are we we're in this current we're in the current predicament we're in at the moment we're all just fixated on race no one seems to be willing to take us out of that conversation everyone's trying to outrace each other right it's sort of like the oppression olympics at the moment isn't it um on one side you've got you know a, some grave concerns from the trans community you know they're kind of speaking up saying hey guys we're still here we're still getting victimized then the other side you've got uh people of color then you've got a delineate then you've got a derivative of that right there's a little off branch of people of color where it's sort of like black then it's sort of like black cis black queer then you go back up in that tree and you go it's not black it's non-black it's brown and then brown there's a subdivision that it's just it's just too messy man and um i don't know I'll, I'll probably speak about it later when i speak about some of the cues that happened in england because in the uk where i'm based most of the shops have reopened so everyone's sort of like you know gone to go get some much needed retail therapy you hear that term often banded around i don't really know where it comes from the actual term retail therapy let me see if i can find out what the actual where the what does what does retail therapy mean? yeah what does retail therapy mean let's see if it's got an origin of it the 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 what is it for what? retail therapy retail therapy the practice of shopping in order to make oneself feel more cheerful cheerful right this is definitely what's happening now at the moment right with um covid19 and with the protests happening around the world i'm not really against it personally i think it's an actual good thing i think people need to actually take their mind off of the daily um dread that they they kind of go through day by day in life they need to kind of have something else to live for um that isn't politics um that isn't wrapped up in their you know racial identity you need to have something else to look forward to on the weekend you don't want to be you know it's sort of like being consumed by work conversations all day long even with your friends you just get boring after a while you want to just you just want to tap out even if it means your friends giving you a bit of gossip about what's happening in their workplace you don't want to be the person just constantly constantly moaning about what you're doing because just it just becomes boring it's not productive anymore it's not fun and i think that's what's happening at the moment i think we already know there's a, we know what the issue is right so i think the people that need to speak about the issue and find solutions should be left alone to do so and i think the rest of us like you know when you go to like a a party with your parents and then you hang out with the parents for a couple of minutes and then you all kind of run off and go and find the other kids right so you can go make around muck around with and the parents are more than happy for you to leave as well right they don't want you around when all the you know when all the adult stuff is happening so i don't think it's a bad thing i think we need to lead the adults to get on with it and us kids myself included some of the numb nuts we need to just step aside and you know do other things that kind of occupy our minds so yeah i'm not i'm not i'm not against it really but i'll touch on that another point but anyway if it's your first time listening to the show thanks so much for tuning in um as per usual to help me out and make sure we spread the word please make sure you like that you know smash that like button down below the video it's not gonna uh it won't take much of an effort just to smash that a couple of times hit subscribe of course leave me a comment down below if you're interested and you want to leave me a comment you know ask me a question or two i will endeavor to get back to you and if you're listening via the podcast app of course make sure you share it and leave me a five star review i actually need to turn on the plug of this ball charger give me one second because it's not actually on There we go. 
mission accomplished sometimes mission accomplished if you listen to the audio podcast you would have heard no interruption if you're watching via video you would have seen me appear and reappear ta-da anyway um what's been happening that's about it, isn't it football's coming back this weekend too that's a good thing yeah, I think even taking into consideration what happened this weekend with all those, with some of those football hooligans and all the Britain, Britain first wild lads, I think we need the football to come back sooner rather than later to keep those guys occupied. They don't need to be outside protesting and trying to fight kids who are like half their age, fit and don't smoke crack, you know. That's not a good use of their time. They need to be in terraces somewhere screaming expletives and, you know, racial insults to people from the safety of stands. They don't need to be doing it up front and personal with Jerome who's like 18 and boxes on the weekend. It's just not a fair fight in it. So, um, I think it's a good thing that f- f- football is back and a Apart from that, not much else is going on in it. Same old, same old, winding on down. Oh, actually, um, Pirate Suits opened this weekend, innit? That's a, some good news in your whole electronic music space. If you're familiar, are you familiar with Pirate Suits? You should be familiar with Pirate Suits. It's, um, it's a pretty cool, all encompassing uh, music studio um, for aspiring musicians that's, you know, all over Europe for the most part, I think. They've got a few places dotted around in Berlin. No, one in Berlin. I'm not sure if they've got anywhere else in Europe. I'm not too sure, but loads in the UK. And essentially, it's these um, all-purpose um, units that, you know, are autonomous, or, you know, you know they're self you what, what they call what they call them. You just basically, yeah. So essentially, it's a studio that you can rent rooms in, right? And they've got studio spaces for bands, studio spaces for DJs. Some of them have podcasting studios. You essentially make a booking online. Um, you get sent a code. You book it by the hours, or you get sent a code via the email or via your smartphone, via the text. And then you get, get given a code for the gate, the actual building, and the door that you're in. You start when you're... You know when your time starts and you leave when your time ends and it's pretty self-explanatory it's one of the best little spots we have in london at the moment and i think it's the best sort of like middle ground option for anyone that wants to do some sort so for anyone that wants to kind of have a bit of a party that's the best option at the moment they're not allowing more than one person from different households to be in one unit which is the issue so if you want to have a bit of a rave that most people do in there you'd have to make sure you're only with your flatmates but yeah I, i'm liking it man let me see if i can see it here where is it um i'll show you a little video of it pirate studios but it's a pretty cool little setup really cool idea um if anything it's maybe our version of like that horror or horror little thing that we have here as in berlin where people go and play sometimes um i really like it it's a really clean setup let me just play this this first one this guy called plugsy he played it let's see what he did Get that volume down to about 60. And then boom, get that on the screen. So yeah, as you can see from the video here, this guy's got, it's just a basic room, some lighting, some good speakers. I think they have a they have a webcam set up in there as well that you can use. Um, so you can stream your, your sets via Facebook and whatever, but I've never actually used it. I'm not sure if it actually works every time we've been in there. Um, the camera equipment is always a bit faulty, but for the most part, it does what it says in the tin. Nice air conditioned room, brightly lit, loads of good sound. Um, you know, the, the soundproofing as well is fucking immaculate. When you close that door, you can't hear jack shit on the other side. So it's a really good room to go and have some bit of fun in and go and DJ. And if you wanna have a bit of a mix, you know, Outside of playing at home on like shitty monitors is the best place to be at. Let's move it along a bit. So as you can see, he's just vibing there, doing his thing. There's a video here of Lucy. Let's see this one. Someone's got some. We're a little bit late. Angles on the top as well here. Let's see. Yeah, so. A pretty good space to go to all, all things considered i can't wait to get back on the decks playing in a on an actual system that would be a fun time it might be a bit bittersweet though because it might be a reminder of just how far away i am from playing in a club again as per other teachers out there i'm sure you're all facing the same sort of fear um i don't know when can we assume clubs will be back um if we're seeing football starting again and if we're seeing you know Judging by the advice that I've been reading online from the people that I follow, they are basically saying that, you know, we're not we shouldn't hold our hopes out for a vaccine. If anything, we should try and mitigate the spread of the virus as much as we can by wearing face masks and adhering to basic hygiene, you know, right? Washing your hands and all that sort of malarkey. 
um so if that's the case a lot of these you know a lot of the venues where mass gatherings are welcomed they're going to have to make a decision or partly based on the government's um on the government's insights they're going to have to make some sort of decision as to how much risk they're willing to take because if a vaccine is not going to be on the cars until next year are those institutions going to be able to survive are football clubs going to survive solely off of the money they get from the tv revenue or will they need some kind of influx of cash coming through the gate regardless even if it's just like you know a half capacity of a stadium they're going to need something coming through i'd imagine so right so it's going to have to be one of the decisions they're going to make like what how many contaminations or in the worst case scenario deaths are we willing to accept in order to reopen things back up again now i guess with clubs the only good thing about nightclubs or bars instead is that like if you live in a if you live in a sunnier place I could imagine there being a push to have loads of like open so for, to have loads of like beer garden sort of spots open up right or to have bars kind of converted into beer garden spots or to have bars have the ability to maybe have patrons stand outside and drink right because that's something that doesn't really happen that often or you get told to go back in after a certain time maybe they kind of um extend the open times so you can stand outside maybe they give uh, people that live in I don't know, bars are located in areas where there's not much car traffic you might maybe designate those roads no car entry or something along those lines that people can have more room to move around and drink those are the options that are kind of probably on the table I reckon in that regard but if I'm thinking about a place like Fold for instance one of our kind of big clubs or the, my favourite club here, here in London or a place like Mixed Garage I can't see that thing being open again and this year really can you? I don't know I can see warehouse parties have happening. I can see forest waves happening, but can you see mixed garage or a fold opening by the end of this year? I'm not too sure. I'd love it to be. Um, fold could probably do that, right? If they somehow were able to get around it and keep that fire exit open, at least at the balcony, that could maybe, you know, be a thing. Um, maybe, possibly, I'm not too sure. But yeah, I would love to see it, man. But regardless of that, I'm looking forward to going to back to Pirate Studios, having a bit of a mix, um, having a bit of a boogie, and essentially doing what I do best in it, which is playing music, recording a podcast, and just being a lad. I think spending too much time on social these days and trying to get involved in politics, which I had no interest in prior to lockdown. But because we're all on our phones and we're all engaged, you kind of have to pay more attention to it than you would hope to and world news events and whatever it's just it's just a bit overwhelming it gets a bit too much um there's only so much you can handle as a person there's only so much ram i have available um and i shouldn't be wasting it on things that i have no knowledge of right there's people out there who have kind of devoted their entire lives to you know combating inequality in whatever what shape or form it may be and now suddenly here we are you know piping our head up thinking that we have an equal parts of a voice to play in it you know we might have a, an opinion we might be we might, we're entitled to an opinion we're entitled to voice whatever opinion we do have and say our piece but if we think we're gonna make any sort of inroads in any sort of way any sort of meaningful way we really are deluded so um yeah i'm trying to stay away from that one and i hope hope it doesn't come across sounding disingenuous or it sounds it comes across sounding a little bit pessimistic i don't mean to be but it's just the reality of the thing isn't it like this is this should be a this should be um this should be a renaissance of expertise really this whole covid lockdown and you know the unfortunate events uh post george floyd death this should be a reckoning that we need experts we need adults in the room right we need um as we've seen with the new zealand prime minister right the difference good strong leadership makes in the response to covid we need a return to adults a return to yeah having adults in the room taking responsibility taking charge making decisive decisions and we need to return to you know uh val valorizing expertise right putting expertise on the on the pedestal and saying hey you've got more knowledge than that person you guys should duke it out and come to a conclusion but we shouldn't be questioning your knowledge right from our kind of skeptical point of view um yeah maybe who knows what do i know but anyway let's move on bubbly bubbly bah what's i talking about oh talking about mixed dj stuff <clears throat> i've actually got a mix out at the moment called test mix number 46 loads of new house stuff that i've been playing or that i've been listening to recently such as that new jada g track that everyone's been banging out both of us 
um so definitely check that out it's available now on soundcloud i would play a bit of it but i'll probably get copy strikes so i don't want to do that so definitely check that out it's available now if you can see that on the screen that's a track list there look at all those amazing tracks i got featured on there I'm not playing any games so definitely check that out if you can it's available now on my soundcloud which is handsome black man all one word you see it there test mix test test sorry mix number 46 test mix number 46 and if you listen to show view the audio podcast you hear a little snippet of the mix playing just after i say this now yeah, you hear that playing and if you're watching a video you won't hear anything playing because i don't want to get a copyright strike so let's move on what else we want to speak about here that was interest oh okay so <coughs> There's a really cool article on GQ Style out of the moment that focuses on Noah NY, the New York uh, men's, I don't know, you call it menswear? Yeah, menswear uh, clothing label uh, founded by Brendan Babson, who was the former direct clothing director or director of style. I forgot what his desk actual title was, but he was formerly known, formerly famous famous for his work at supreme who's now been at the head of noah ny i think since 2015 or something along those kind of lines right noah has been making some inroads in the scene for the most part i think you know most of you guys are probably familiar with the hoodies but um a lot of their outerwear and cuttings quote unquote cut and sew stuff is really amazing some of their footwear collaborations have been really spot on um the the belts that they make are you know probably an underrated item in their in their arsenal and of course the shorts um but they gq started putting together a really cool sort of interview and understanding of bread and baby and trying to understand how a brand is operating in the post or in the you know in the current covid world especially um with the backdrops of the uh, George Floyd protests happening now um, in America or mostly around the world and I think the interview itself was really really refreshing and really insightful but one thing that really struck out for me I'm going to mention it here but let me just quickly show you the interview so this is um, from GQ Style it says how a menswear brand stays afloat and stays ethical uh, through pandemic and protest so it says the coronavirus presents an existential threat to the fashion industry while calls for racial justice uh, challenge brands to live up to their principles. GQ went inside Brendan Babson, independent, socially minded Noah, as the world turned upside down this spring. It's written by a guy called Sam Scoob or Scoob, Scoob, I really pronounce his name. But this bit really stuck out to me here at the bottom, right? And I'll read a bit more of it afterwards. Uh, duh. So it says here I called up Brendan Babson on April, up in April, sorry, amidst a swell of uncertainty curious about how a brand like his survives when the world caves in as we spoke um, over the course of the month Babjan's plan goose online marketing introduce some canny promotions and trust these customers would come through seem to be working sales were down across the board 30 to 40 percent by Babjan reckoning store closures meant that the brand's monthly in-person revenue of anywhere between 200 to 300 thousand in a month had evaporated but t-shirts hoodies were still flying out on the online shop and the full collection some portion of it at least would make it out of the factories into stores if stores opened i'm pretty confident we'll have a fair amount of product and general public might not notice any difference he said now the bit that stuck out for me was of course this bit i didn't know stores make this much in terms of like what they sell in store from just you know general foot traffic i'm guessing that's what that means right um revenue they make anywhere between two hundred thousand to three hundred thousand per month which makes you which makes me understand why a lot of these because i've always thought why is some of these brands coming up like i remember reading something about ian Connor's brand wanting i think he tweeted actually he wants he's he's in the mind he's in the hopes of opening up a retail store uh, there's rumors about midnight studios doing the same thing um a lot of these kind of you wouldn't call them micro brands but a lot of these brands are essentially pretty lean operation and for the most part independent want and who absolutely kill it online right midnight studios being a good example and even ian connor Seco, they absolutely kill it online in terms of sales direct to consumer ship out the product from their base no hassle no uh nonsense you'd wonder why they'd want to get involved in trying to open a brick and mortar store right because you know having worked in a store having worked in streetwear stores having worked in fashion stores having been around that environment i know it's no easy game um to get involved and to what to open your own brick and mortar store is not something that you do off the cuff but 
it's a long story tradition isn't it? in menswear or in general in fashion right the idea of wanting to own your own spot so that you can essentially invite your customer or potential customers into your world you can kind of craft and merchandise and you know really adorn the store with all the things that influence the brand that are probably that you can't really translate on a 2d image or you can't really translate on a piece of fabric a store will go a long way to doing that from the incense that you use to the music that plays in the background to the staff that you hire to the fixtures that you use the publications that you um sell in your store all of these things are going to be little tiny indications little tiny style codes that you leave all dotted around the brand that really let people understand what you're really about and if i think about you know where that kind of origin comes from probably you know from the skateboarding world going into like skater on stores where you know the guy that works there is essentially there eight days a week you know 365 days in a year um he's you know if he's got a dog you're really familiar with it if he's got friends that work with him that also skate for the team you're familiar with it they don't never hire anyone external it's always people within the family all that sort of vibe kind of adds to the law of the store that you shop at and sometimes it even elevates it's really shitty product up to a level that you kind of think wow i kind of i gotta have this t-shirt even though it's made from on a, on a terrible blank it's printed you know it's printed with zero to little quality assurance you still want it because you, you associate with that store you associate with the brand owner you associate with that scene so i guess the same thing is at foot when you walk into a noah store and i've walked into their store in new york and it's fucking gorgeous right um one of the probably best merchandise and presented stores i've been in in a while very refreshing place to go into you don't get none of that kind of like bro iced out sort of like um yeah you don't get broed out right you don't all oh, they know they call it you don't get vibed out in the noah store everyone's really friendly and courteous and just generally nice enough for a chat and i guess that's one of the main things what you really want when you go to a menswear clothing store right you're already a bit of a geek anyway because you spend all your wages on you know on a pair of corduroy pants the least that you want is a bit of chat right to make that pant purchase worth it because you know for sure no one's going to agree with you so i thought that was a really eye-opening that a store would still make that much but the entire interview is really enlightening i really recommend you check it out um brendan's a really cool guy um loads of bits in there about him questioning his position he's played the part he's played in systemic racism in the US, which I think is a little bit harsh on himself. I think he's doing a good job with the platform he has. Um, he's trying to educate his customers, trying to relay that message back to them and so that they can affect change in their own little way. And just being an all round really good dude, man. I really recommend you check it out. Again, one of the better one of the better dudes in the street where menswear scene at the moment, somebody that doesn't ask too much for their customers but always gives a lot for the community. Somebody that does kind of install all the values that it means to be involved in streetwear apart from the selling of the limited edition clothes and then get upset when people ransack your store brendan is the real deal i definitely recommend you check him out man and really support the stuff that he's doing there and just generally kind of you know send him love and support during these tough times i'm sure um that they what you know they're having to hang in there especially in new york you know um there's loads of conflicting reports there about what um como is doing and if he's doing things right or wrong and de blasio is obviously not getting a bit of a good rep so i can imagine the kind of turmoil that's causing for business owners so definitely um reach out to him if you can and give me love or better yet read the article share with your friends and yeah spread the the noah love that way it's on gq style now it's titled how men's wear brands stay afloat and stay ethical through a pandemic and protest again i'll link in the show notes for you guys to check out i'll put in the podcast description i always put notes and little links to the articles i mentioned so definitely make sure you check that out and if you read listening watching via so youtube channel check down below you'll have the link there below you can watch the you can sorry, read the article yourself in full next on the list here um what is that i think was of interest to show you Bish, 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 bosh. Oh, I quite like this actually. Let's, let's go for this. Let's go for the the power. Where is it? Where's the where's the where's the where is it? There we go. So, Pata, one of my favorite streetwear brands actually at the moment, have put released a little capsule collection of a packable chair and table courtesy of a brand called Helinux. Hel- Hel- Helinux, Helinux, Helinux. Helinox, Helinox, I'm not really familiar with them, maybe they're an outdoor based company, we'll find out via this Hype Beast article, so it says here, yeah, 
Patter partners with Helin Helinox Helinox for a packable chair and side table. Um, let's check this video out. So you got a dude here dressed impeccably cool, grey model t-shirt, nice pair of uh, chinos with some black derby shoes. And he's got a little pouch on the side wrapped around the edge. Well, wrapped around the side on his body. I'm not sure if that's a foldable chair and a little tote bag. Let's see how it unveils. There's a bag. He unpacks it, unzips one bag, takes it out. Oh, that transforms into a chair. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. Then he clips it and the chair. There you go. And then we'll save a bit. That goes over it and makes it more comfy. Makes it padded and then you've got the tote bag. It opens that up. What's in there? So it's like a beret. It's not a beret. Chopsticks, not chopsticks. What is that? Oh, it's a table. Look at that. That is super cool. And you've got a table copy. No, that was, that was pretty cool to be honest. Let's go back there and look at that. That's, that's swagged out. I like this anyway because regardless of how pretentious or naff some people may think that is, I think it's a good thing that um Pat is sort of in a weird way encouraging their customer bases to kind of explore and get out there and, you know, go and travel the world a bit. Similar to the thing that happened with um away luggage. Remember when away luggage was everywhere, people were they were sponsoring every brand and everything, right? Doing collaborations. It was a bit naff, but I like the idea that there was this kind of millennial travel luggage company right that was sort of pushing this idea of connecting um community exploration wanderlust right with a generation of people who are pretty boring by them by the most by all intense purposes right they'd rather spend time you know making up dances on tiktok and shit or showing off what they bought on instagram than actually going out and experiencing you know having kind of experiential uh uh, experiences, experiential experiences, experiential events. Yeah, going out there and just exploring the world, right? I'm not too sure if that's a good assumption, but I would say that so much. So, so it's good to see them, <coughs> and for sure, for sure, I'm um, safe to assume the streetwear crowd of kids, of hype kids, let's say, who queue up outside of Pata or Supreme and stuff to go and buy the latest tracksuit aren't thinking about going on holiday somewhere really nice. They're just thinking about what they can buy that they can you know show off to their friends on non school uniform day so to kind of give them a bit of a travel bug or to get them in interested in the great outdoors that's a great way to go about things and i think that's a great um way to use your platform if you're a brand like patter right um pushing kids into that direction showing them something a bit different i like that idea so let's go into the article it says amsterdam star what patter has unveiled its latest collaboration teaming up with helenix for a brand new capsule of furniture the collection contrasts with helenix traditional to outdoor and, and camping influences instead of taking inspiration from small city apartments the patter helenix collaboration features a helenix one chair complete with a rocking feet for guaranteed comfort as well as a branded side table both pieces come with a red faux leather covers oh that's awesome um and can easily be packed away into a small bag without the red cover both pieces come in black complete with pattern script logo um on both texts yeah so really nice man I'm, I'm a big fan of this not sure how much it'll be as a collaboration piece but that's pretty cool i'd use this actually day to day but it's a pretty cool thing to wear use on great outdoors if you go on a hiking trip or something um, take a look at the items above the full coverage from release via the Pata app on June 17th before launching on the brand's web store physical location in Amsterdam London in May and Milan sorry June 19th Pata also recently collaborated here so it's Milan anniversary of two okay cool pretty cool I'm a big fan of it so definitely check that out available when June 19th in Amsterdam and London that's Pata Palantoning with Helinux. Helinux, how you pronounce it? Helinux, right? H-E-L-I-N-O-X for a packable chair and side table. Thank you for that news. Okay, let's move on. What else we got on a docket here to talk about? Got stuff about him, stuff about her. Let's actually minimize you. Let's go new. Let's put you over here. Okay, this what's the next bit? 
So L O S L O R. Let's see this bit. I like when I put on my notes. I always put L O R sometimes. I'm like, okay, what does L O R actually mean, right? Is it something I've seen online? Is it a dumb thing? Is it a good thing? Let's see what this is. No brain. Okay, this is kind of a roundup of some of the anti. Because I, I guess have you heard of the phrase? They're being banned around the moment, anti-racist, right? It's a pretty odd one, isn't it? It's a bit of an oxymoron. Um, it's either you're a racist or you're not, right? There's no such thing as an anti-racist, but, you know, whatever. Um, this is 2020 lexicon. But um, I guess this video is a good example as to what they mean when they say anti-racist, right? Um, this is all the ho football hooligans that um, we saw descend on the London streets um, in an effort to protect the statues that they thought were desecrated, that they thought were being disrespected and desecrated by hordes of young, you know, teens uh, or young people in general who are out protesting um, police brutality in the wake of George Floyd's death in London the last couple of weekends. So as a natural reaction, you know, with every what action comes a reaction, um, hordes of Dave's around the country for you know what enough's enough someone needs to stand up to Winston someone needs to stand up for Winston Churchill and go and fight for his honour and it did so much when he went to Last Church London but the results weren't as they pleased but it's just funny to see some of them actually speak of course it's not their fault you know they're not paid to be orators they're probably not in the right state of mind to speak on camera they probably had a couple of k you know probably a couple a couple tints of k and probably a couple lines of k in them but um, this video from Joe's nonetheless very, very funny. And play for you guys now. Get this on widescreen. It has to, it just has to be stopped. We are one. If you want to be one, look us. Why? I've probably had a fight with that bloke. You know, that one, that one. Yeah, what, uh, the football. Well, yeah. And we stand together, yeah. It's funny that they stand together, though, isn't it? That one, that one. Is there, is there something in common with other people standing together? There's not, you know, there's something in common about these guys that are standing together. You know, imagine hordes of football hooligans who have really bitter rivals, right? Violent rivalries, rivalries that result in people losing limbs and eyes and, you know, being, you know, scarred for life and shit. But somehow they're able to put the differences to one side for one special day. Not Christmas, not Halloween not fucking you know a, a parade when west ham win the champions league no none of that stuff they happen to put all the differences to one side just so they can go and fight some black kids in london <laughs> what does that tell you about these kind of people hey eh? don't like what's happening no mate there's no need to take the statues down you know what i mean it's just like hey, capaldi capaldi hasn't got a patch on me mate yeah there's no need to take statues down. <laughs> These guys are legend. I'm telling you. Do you think I need a haircut? What? Do you think I need a haircut? <laughs> you need your teeth brushing, mate. <laughs> Thousands of protesters have gathered in central London, <laughs> Westminster, to protest against the Black Lives Matter movement. They've gathered around the Churchill statue behind me after it was vandalised last weekend. We're here to ask them what they think. We're here purely, no violence, just to no violence right and then they've got a video of a journalist or a photographer or somebody within the media who absolutely got his nose smashed the fucking it looks broken to me because there's blood profusely you know dripping from it and luckily he's still got his SLR in his hand that's probably the most you know, important thing I think if you ask this photographer if he could get punched in the face or get his camera stolen I'm pretty sure you say get punched in the face unless he's got really good insurance but the juxtaposition of saying there's no violence right whilst they punch the lights out of a photographer who happens to be white unfortunately right so they happen to have like a no media rule but they also seem to have a no blacks rule very very bizarre it reminds me of like a <laughs> it reminds me of like a motorcycle club right no cameras no blacks protest about the way our statues are being desecrated or also defaced and because the police have done nothing They're about it again. we've come here because they won't look after them and that's basically it I love how uh, patriotic these guys are, isn't it? Defending inanimate objects. It's just, it beggars belief, really. Don't get me wrong. I, I was never a big fan of desecrating Winston Churchill's statue. I think anyone who's been doing it of history would know 
Winston Churchill's legacy is tainted and complicated like a lot of people from his time but he'd done a lot more he'd done a lot more good than he has done bad and the bad that he has done could just be explained away but you know according to the times that he lived in argue if you want disagree if you want but it doesn't warrant um, a cost and effort to kind of topple his statue and have it you know dumped in a Thames somewhere he's not that bad of a guy let's be for real but still going out of your way to go and you know have a couple of bevies in you do a couple of lines and drink a stellar or two put on your best stone island and your gazelles to go and beat up kids to, for the statue that's insane this has nothing to do with color creed anything and that's what i said before the other day right what 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 happens if you're raheem sterling and you see this these lunatics with England tattoos on the back, right? And I think that, is that Britain first or no? That's another football. No, that's two England crests on his back, right? Um, they're a bit naughty, these guys, though, isn't it? They're a bit naughty, right? Like, it's hard to put, how would you put on the free liner shirt knowing that these, these, these people make up some of your fan base? I guess you can't, you know, you can't avoid the ugly truth of the racial tensions that exist in England for the most part. Um, like I mentioned, if you go to football games, you know what the deal is, right? You know what these guys say in the stands. You know what they say to you after you've finished and you're in the bars and pubs and they feel as if like they can talk to you as a friend and you won't judge them. You know what they say and it's never, it's never wholesome. It's purely that. I mean, it's, it's a ridiculous thing. You, you, history is what it is. Um, this has turned into a slavery issue from some bloke dying by a corrupt... Uh, policeman. Um, I didn't see any colour. I see a man die by a corrupt policeman. Hmm, that's a bit of a stretch, though, isn't it? There's obviously, you know, not not to debate the dude, but we know for sure that even though black people are probably um, what's the statistics that they make up thirteen percent of the U.S. population, but they account for fifty percent of the violent crimes. If you're if you've got your sociology hat on, you could explain the reason why, you know, economic situations, lack of opportunities lead to people to commit more crimes. If you somehow address that imbalance, you probably don't get as many violent crimes. And but then on top of that, you also there's no denying that the police do have a tendency to fear black men when it comes to police interactions it's just the nature of it you can you know there's many anecdotal videos you can find on youtube of encounters between black and brown people and you know caucasian people and it doesn't and some of the times the outcomes are the same but some, most of the times the outcomes are not the same um so to suggest that they race didn't play some part in it is ridiculous to, to suggest race was the entire reason why George Floyd died is also ridiculous but you know it's no to have no empathy or humanity in your heart to understand why some black people in the UK in France um, in Holland in Germany in New Zealand in Australia you for, to not understand why some people around the world would feel sympathy towards that and would use that as an opportunity to maybe talk about some of their own injustices happening in their own country is ridiculous as well that's the ridiculous part of it you have to understand that come on yeah stop with the colors stop it because every time you say black lives matter you are putting a divide in between us all not really you are being racist. it's really that people say that though isn't it so it's like saying you can't say like you it's like saying you can't say um united 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 or you can't you know chant your own team or something because you're then you're then des denigrating the value of the other team it's a bizarre statement we know all lives matter that's that's a given but in some countries and in some places other lives apart from the indigenous life don't matter with most of the others it's just it is what it is isn't it we know this to be a fact so to go out there and say all lives matter is sort of a redundant statement. It's just like, all right, cool, the sky is blue. We are aware of that. But some people don't believe Black Lives Matter because if anything, all lives matter is a demonstration that you don't believe Black Lives Matter because you're so quick to do that. All this bickering about colour, race, where you come from, it's just, it's, it's just daft, isn't it? So, Getting well, out of hand. Could you tell me what... Yeah, he's not, nothing wrong with him at all, is it? What? Uh, Winston Churchill represents to you. What does he mean to you? He's, he is father of our country since the war. Without the war, father of our country, who was essentially ousted right from politics and essentially died alone in his bed, right? 
father father of our country treated like absolute shit after world war ii but father of our country or would these people rather have adolf hitler's descendants looking after us this is democracy and that's what it's supposed to be a democracy but that's a problem though in a democracy if they would have voted for that statue to come down these same numbnuts would have still been protesting against anyway so that's why sometimes I, I disagree. I think sometimes just tearing it down for the sake of it, even if it's just you know, for the rage tear down and they put it back up later anyway, at least you made your point. I think, you know, putting together petitions, you know, going to the local council and arguing your case doesn't really get you far. People don't really do Like I've, I've noticed it myself in working in companies and corporate places. The moment you start threatening people with violence or with, you know, public shaming and shit is the moment they start moving and they start making a change if you start going down the official channels they don't do anything no one pulls their finger out of their ass we're here to just like stop this carnage we're here peacefully as you can see you don't need to rob places you don't need to hurt people you just need to turn up and be peaceful mate people are getting washed right to <laughs> support support the english army he is you know what I mean? he is what's waved, happening right he is I don't waved. agree with it mate statues <laughs> it fucking it's all over me uh, yeah the racism's coming back me because of the fucking bh men you what? can't rewrite or dis <laughs> destroy it, your history history's there for us to learn from and nurture we've got what we've got today because of what we've learned from our mistakes and our history to wipe that out it, it, it is I just, it's nonsensical i guess so mate i guess so but yeah, funny, isn't it? We've all got different opinions on that one. But anyway, let's move on. That one's done. What else is it? National Hero. Yeah, we need to give this guy a bit of credit too. Give him a bit of shine because of in all the madness that happened, um, he stood out like an absolute beacon. Um, so this is the absolute unit that managed to, in his all his kind graces, um, escort a guy that was getting absolutely washed by the crowd out of a crowd or well, yeah washed by a horde of teenagers get him out there before his head got taken off his shoulders and he really showed a lot of humility in the interview i wasn't surprised at the fact i think anyone that would do that put themselves at risk of getting hit in the head um by putting themselves in between an angry mob and a, somebody that represents a you know the British, what are they called? Britain First Movement, or whatever they are. If, uh, would you call them far right? I don't know whether they deemed them to be, but to do that in his case was very brave because you know there there could have been some backlash too. Right, he could have easily been labelled as a coon or something, but he decided to do it regardless. And yeah, credit to the dude. So this is from Channel Four News. This is um, uh, a guy called Patrick Hutchinson who was pictured carrying a protester to safety at a violent demo. Says as what happened. Let's just hear what he has to say about it volume up a little bit on arrival i know you know at this point the, the guy was already on the floor um it was pretty hectic um it was almost like a stampede there was lots of people you know there were people trying to protect him but unsuccessfully and then the guys went in there um they sort of put a little cordon around him to stop um him receiving any more um you know um physical harm he, he, he was still yeah yeah he was, he was under physical harm you know he was under his life was under under threat yeah he was getting washed to be fair i think if that's the same video we saw before he was getting absolutely spun around and credit to the guy man right like he defers already to his group of guys who made a cordon around him you could just tell this guy is a shining example of what we should be as a nation just tolerant but it made me think you know in general like those riots on the weekend just made me laugh like no no part of me felt threatened or felt intimidated you know growing up in the ends you've seen these people you know they exist you live around you live amongst them some of them have you know you know some of them have their own prejudices that they you know have to deal with in themselves some of them have experiences they've gone through that have made them think that way but regardless you just live you just live with it um and generally most of the rage come from them towards us as opposed to the other way around for the most part we don't like i remember even in school there'd be some absolute nutters in our area that'd go around with their dads and stuff like you know trying to hunt after some black kid who they thought maybe did their kid you know did their kid over or something i don't know some kid beat up some white boy in school and then he got his dad and his brother who happened to be 22 at the time to come and beat up one of my friends and he just they're on the streets looking for him you know 
going to cages and stuff and you know going to parks and just roaming around looking for a child essentially to beat up and you're like these guys are weird isn't it and you just look at them like fucking psychos we didn't ever get scared or think oh these guys are gonna kill us no just for these guys are fucking losers you just didn't want to be that person when you were growing up so when you got older and you, you know you had a bit of a growth spurt or you got some courage and you thought you know what i'm gonna fight back you soon realize the moment you hit them back they don't have an answer they're all chest and arms out and you what you what you know cocking their neck back like a flipping turkey but once you hit them once it's just over this all you know they just have no idea what's going on it's sort of like um it reminds me of that famous mike tyson quote in it like everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face and um whilst they did that i sort of just thought well if he stays here he's he's not gonna make it so i just went under <laughs> scooped him up he's not gonna make it top lad man and uh sort of started marching towards the police with him whilst all the guys were sort of surrounding me and protecting me and the um and the guy i had on my shoulder and all i this could actually feel i could actually feel you know you know you know what i thought he's gonna say i said that i thought he's gonna say i could actually feel his life slipping away from me as i was carrying him and i knew if i didn't get any help he would die on my shoulder and i didn't want that smoke you know imagine you pick some guy up uh, trying to escort him to a health a safety point or an extraction zone and then he ends up dying on your shoulder because he's been punched in the head too many times that's not the smoke you want I only thought you can say that. I could feel his life slipping away from me. His heartbeat was <laughs> racing against my shoulder. But he's a much better guy than I am, of course. Strikes and hits as I was carrying him, you know. So, you know, these guys were probably taking some of that Blood, <laughs> yeah. on, on, on their person. It sounds like it was a very uh, scary moment. Yeah, it was. You don't think about that though, at the time. You just sort of do what you've got to do, you know what I mean? Top man. I can only imagine when I, last night when I was thinking about it, I was thinking to myself if the uh, the other three police officers that were standing around when George Floyd was um, you know murdered um, had thought about you know intervening and stopping their uh, their colleague from doing what he was doing, like what we did, um, you know George you know George Floyd would be alive today still. Very true, but unfortunately that thin blue line. Um, that loyalty they have between each other it's just it, it doesn't even know, there's no comparison like at the moment i'm watching this series called um the bureau it's a french spy thriller right it's amazing and um one of the main tenets around it is that you know everyone is essentially is disloyal as fuck they preach about loyalty right that's one of the tenets of one of the mantras of the french um secret service but essentially everyone's a double agent or a triple agent or, you know, whatever. They're all working for different um, foreign powers and they have different people, different interests inside their business. It's just a very, very murky world. And those guys have, you know, there's actually real life consequences at stake if somebody leaks something, information or isn't cared for or whatever it may be. And they're very disloyal. But then the police force, you know, mostly made up of average everyday folk like you and i we haven't necessarily gone for any kind of rigorous training they've got this sense of loyalty that surpasses anything you'd see from the special services from the, from the secret services of countries around the world anything you'd see from the mob anything you'd see from any kind of organized crime conglomerate anything you'd see from like a cartel and without the threats of violence and stuff, right? Because the cartel have threats of violence. If you snitch, you know, your whole family tree gets hung headless from a bridge somewhere. But the police don't have any of that. And they still have such a, you know, such that, 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 they, that shields has such an influence, such a hold on police officers that they can't see right and wrong. They only just see the badge. It's very bizarre. I mean, you, you kind of become a national hero. <laughs> Yeah, like, like I say, I mean, I was just the guy that was caught on camera with the yeah, thing on my man. shoulder, but top like, all these guys were all party to it. Um, without them protecting me, I would have probably got stampeded as well <laughs> underneath it, you know, so it was like a team effort. What a, what a nice guy, man. What a nice guy. And again, an example to all of us. Um, what a nice, nice dude. Let's move on. Du, 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 du. The numbers are wild for clubs reopening. Oh, yeah. This is one. This one probably touched upon via the ones things I spoke about previously. Did I speak about? It? No, I didn't. Okay, so uh, this is from DJ Mag. It says the UK club's capacity drops from three hundred and seventy to thirty based on the government guidelines for reopening. Now, this is obviously just a. I think this is like a hypothetical 
or theoretical sort of example, someone put together a club owner based on the current suggestions they got from the government as to if they reopen now, how would how would it what would it look like? And this is another example as to why I think you know clubs probably won't come back again until the new year, and you know probably have to make do with beer gardens and shit for the most part, or having to drink outside or you know warehouse parties if you can find them. So it says the following. It says a UK club would see its capacity drop from 370 to 30 if they adhere to the new government guidelines. Swansea club Hangar 18, who has thrown parties with DJ Seinfeld and Glitterbox DJ Melva Baptiste, shared a post on Facebook that um, the dire uh, impact of social distancing guidelines would have on reopening the venue. It says the following. We have just done our capacity planning diagram as per as part of the Reeves, which is um, the reopening of every venue safely. Hangar 18 wrote in a statement on Facebook, our capacity drops from 370 just to 26 people on the floor and four people on the stage under the social distancing measures, which puts a nail in the coffin for us as there would be no way to reopen the venue limited to that capacity. We will have to wait until it's either brought down to one meter distance or until the distancing finishes altogether. And that's the problem, isn't it? That I'm seeing a lot of people having, especially restaurants, they've kind of been fighting against a two meter rule for a while. I think there's a few, there's like a contingency of restaurateurs and stuff that are putting together a plan that they're going to present to parliament so they can can re, they can kind of take the two meter rule down to one meter so they have some ability to make some money um two meters just isn't is impossible and i guess the same would be said for a club and a bar if you could double the capacity to 60 or maybe to 100 that's when you can maybe some make it somewhat viable but to have a club that formerly has 370 people to down to 30 it just makes no no sense and um that's another example as to why you know i think most of these places just wait until the laws relax until reopening i think trying to um reopen now and have the risk of getting somebody with covid you know having someone test positive at your club just because you wanted to get 50 people in there and be the first on the press stories and stuff is not worth the hype it's not worth the hassle sorry i'd much rather wait until things get relaxed a little bit and there's a little bit more you know more data more examples of people doing things and then going from there it continues here it says the venue also calculated that to cover the 500 in cotton band fees they would have to charge 1923 per ticket and would lose an approximate 700 on the night that was sold out you can see the full post here below and i guess it's like an example of just how they would spread everybody out into these kind of designated zones you know sort of similar to like the little circles you saw in those other clubs featured around the world with people standing in these little circles to dance again i'm not that desperate to go outside i can make do with the whole pirate studio session and you know meeting up with friends in a park or just hanging out i don't need to go to a bar that badly personally um but yeah distressing news there from clubland let's move on uh congrats to matthew williams yeah of course it's huge congratulations to him news just broke what recent just today actually um it's probably the worst kept secret in fashion i'd say for the most part i think everyone with anyone with their finger on a pulse anyone that follows you know certain individual on social like pam boy and a few other people would have known that this news was already kind of been spoken about for a while but um matthew williams has been formally announced as the head is it no where is he for me now as the head creative or is it artistic director of Givenchy um really really big news for him so definitely congrats and a really good example of just how far the Kanye influence spreads in it like he's been able to essentially get three of his best mates you know or two of his best mates some really stellar jobs and the announcement on Instagram was really really cool so this is from Instagram here I'll put it up on here on screen it says the following it says I'm grateful I'm sorry I'm extremely honored to join the house of Givenchy the Maison's unique position and timeless aura make f make it an undeniable icon and I'm looking forward to working together with his ateliers and teams to move it into a new era based on modernity and creativity I'm grateful to LVMH group for trusting me for the opportunity to fulfill my lifelong dream in these unprecedented times of the world I want to send a message of hope and together with my community and colleagues and intend to contribute towards positive change so i think it's really cool personally and again goes to show just how far just how important of a figure Kanye West is in the fashion industry more so than people want to want to really give him credit for from the stuff he's doing with Yeezy in terms of manufacturing in terms of product in terms of lookbooks in terms of presentation to obviously the fact that he's been able to 
um, mentor in some way, shape or form or have his influence be seen in the work of Jerry Lorenzo, Virgil, of course, Matthew Williams. Um, there's a few other people, Don Don C's, even a good example. All right. Um, they've all been kind of been able to permeate culture in their own really unique ways. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing what Matthew Williams' vision of Givenchy is going forward. Again, I'm not that au fait with the House of Givenchy. Don't, I stopped paying attention after Ricardo Tishi left. I thought that was probably one of my favorite eras in fashion, hands down. It sort of reminded me of the golden era of Tom Ford at Gucci. Um, it was sort of like a, a, a return to like modern masculinity, I think, because I spent so much time obsessed with Raph Sim right and that era of um masculinity that was really skinny really gaunt to see someone like ricardo tishi present this really overtly masculine uh male caricature or male figure um to really kind of uh, put that on a platform was something that really inspired me and really kind of captured my imagination but since then i've sort of like you know pulled back and not really gave given much of my attention to the house of Givenchy. but i'll be interested to see what matthew williams can do to that house how he can reinvent it how he can maybe maybe not reinvent it, maybe just go back to the archives and just kind of give his interpretation on the archive pieces they have maybe similar to what demo did at balenciaga right taking some codes from the house and it basically giving it his twist or his presentation style towards it or he could do a completely different take and you know really um what's that word called really defy expectation and come with something completely different completely fresh you know people love to kind of i feel as if he i feel as if Matt williams more so than anyone in that group is probably one of the people that rejects the the streetwear tag more than most people i think he views himself as a bridge between streetwear and menswear or fashion right he's what he thinks he's he's going to be able to kind of carry those kids through um so if that's the case i'd imagine he'd probably want to steer away from doing anything that would be deemed as streetwear he'd want to make it luxe and contemporary if that makes us any sort of sense but he wouldn't want it to be quintessential hoodies t-shirts and trainers we probably still might see those things being introduced because i think you know a good way to win with getting these kind of jobs i'd imagine so right it would be just to create some really stellar um popular items that just sell through really well I, i'd imagine you know virgil abloh sort of like luggage um and little kind of pouches and belts and saddles and harnesses and stuff those kind of things may sell just well year in year out regardless and i think it's Matt williams is able to do the same thing as Givenchy, maybe introducing you know a maybe not a belt maybe he's kind of worn that one out but something a, a trainer a, a trinket some sort of belt holder i don't know whatever he decides to do that just sells really well that will buy him a lot of time so he can experiment a bit more with what he does on a runway or he might just go completely commercial and decide to turn the job that he's got Givenchy into his sort of like you know um armani apprenticeship right to sort of go through and do the armani thing and present you know 155 looks of just pure utter menswear clothing i don't know i, I didn't just see what option he kind of goes down here but sees our post regarding the appointment um some images here pressure by paula paula reversi of course um iconic fashion photographer and another one here says a message from Givenchy on your appointment. It says Hasra Givenchy is pleased to announce the appointment of Matthew M. Williams as creative director, effective on June 16th. Uh, Matthew M. Williams will take on all creative responsibilities for the women's and men's collections. Wow, he's doing both women's and men's. Amazing, I didn't realize that. Uh, Sydney Toled Toledano, chairman and CEO of the LVMH Fashion Group, declares, I am very happy to see Matthew M. Williams join the LVMH Group. Since he took part in the LVMH Prize, we have had a pleasure to watch him develop into the great talent he is today i believe his singular vision of modernity will be a great opportunity for Givenchy to write his new chapter um with the strength and success i wonder if the collaboration he did with dior was a good little primer to this was that part of the interview process because we heard rumors of him being linked to Givenchy maybe five to six months ago would that be part of the, the interview process right kind of like i wonder how they do it when they headhunt you does that do they make a short list of people they want approaching or do they kind of introduce themselves to you regardless and sort of get a feel on what you're doing if you're negotiating with somebody else and then maybe they use an opportunity or maybe they kind of place you in contact with somebody like a kim jones or put the word in behind the scenes so that he can collaborate with you is that a thing that happens or 
is it just a kind of a serendipity that you happen to have your friend Kim Jones work at Dior he wants you to work alongside him and you kind of say hey Givenchy look at this other stuff I'm doing over there I wonder what happens um, in that regard uh, but that's cool man it says it continues here it says um Re renewed de lescun de lescun i you pronounce that ceo and president of givenchy states i want to warmly welcome matthew m williams to the beautiful maison givenchy i am convinced that with his unapologetic approach to design and creativity in great collaboration with the maison's exceptional ateliers and teams matthew will help givenchy reach its potential so yeah congratulations to him man like well deserved if anyone in the street where um sphere or world deserves this role is him i do think it's something he dreamed of for a while he was pivoting away from you know the conventional streetwear tropes for a while and moving away into fashion um i feel like a leaks in the last few years has really 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 kind of come into his own um you see it in the presentation you see it in the shows you see it in the popularity in terms of the stuff that kids wear all the time i love the stuff he does with leather with the leaks um some of the modular stuff he does with the shoes is really sensational the detailing is incredible um really high quality i can't wait to see what he does going forward and uh, he's even got his bio as well you actually created director man so congrats to him what a what a come up what a fucking come up congratulations um let's move on here what else we've got i want to talk about oh return to shopping is good for most people yeah let's just end it on that one i think i spoke about this before right but i honestly think like as much as 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 great as it's been to have this pu public dialogue with people um about all things concerning race police brutality inequality in the workplace and all that nice stuff right i think it's going to be pretty good to see things sort of return to some semblance of normality people going out to bars people going to meeting their friends extending their bubble of communication or contact um people going out to shops and buying shit having a bit of retail therapy you know to ease their woes people need that I think spending that so much time on your phone, spending so much time on the internet, spending so much time on social media in general, so much time indoors, and then having to be inundated with images of people being cracked over head with batons and thrown on the floor and you know bleeding from their earlobes and sprayed with pepper spray and all that sort of nonsense. It just does something to their brain. There's only so much. Um, there's only so much misery misery porn one person can handle in one setting right you need to kind of diversify your um um diversify your entertainment your sources of entertainment in some way shape or form you can't be just subjected to it all day every day it's not healthy so i think this um reintroduction of shops and the reopening of shops is probably a good thing in general going forward and i guess in by the cues that we see in this bbc news article everyone else agrees so this is from the bbc it says queues and social distancing as shops reopen um, as lockdown measures are relaxed across england monday high street shops have opened with safety measures in place and this is a queue outside nike town of all these young lads queuing to go buy i don't know an assortment of um, nike goods some rentable scooters out here in the front um yeah so all these kids that would have been spending their time you know maybe looting or ransacking the streets or buying items or you know just generally distracting themselves which is a good thing and then you've got the same thing with all the mums and girls shopping for their essentials in primark primark done a really cool thing where they've kind of essentially closed all the change rooms so no changing rooms loads of points of places where you can get some hand sanitizer and all that good stuff um and then of course encourage people to wear face masks when they're indoors nice amount of social distancing there a woman came with a full hazmat suit and just hiding her face for some reason. I don't know why, but hey, bless her. Um, this is Gosmus um, jewelry store. I think this might be one of the best and worst times to work in retail. The best because you've got got many people coming into the store, so there's not you know they're not gonna fuck up your your stock. They're not gonna fuck up your what do we call it your standards, right? Um, everything's going to be nice you can get a chance to kind of replan as the day goes on but it also might be the worst because you might encounter some of the most entitled um, dickheads that ever existed that will come out during you know the, the easing of the lockdown shopping it shouldn't be like that but judging by all the videos of the Karens we see online I don't know why it, it kind of brings out the worst in people when we're in the worst situation for some reason not too sure but yeah um, 
lovely lady here with a with a visor that I'm going to be wearing this weekend or the weekend I decide to go out. I'd love to see that there. Tough Tarts in Brighton as well, doing the same, doing the damn thing. So I guess for business owners, it must be really nice experience to be able to go back again and reopen your store right your livelihood that you essentially be able to put food in a plate for your family a girl here sticking her tongue out being a mess more pictures of people queuing shopping and again i would have thought if you'd have told me during the co during the lockdown people would be going out queuing to go to square primark i would have been like those guys are dumb nuts you know losers idiots but now i've completely changed my mind i think people need a bit of respite from the craziness of the world that's going on at the moment right global pandemic global race wars the last thing we need is concern that again we need to go out and just kind of you know touch and feel people again some people need it i don't necessarily but i think some people do need it and uh, they need that respite and again another ominous picture stay take care and stay safe and this woman's really suspicious looking at the camera <laughs> water stones it's funny though right look at the difference between primark at the top or over, over here right has my look at a queue and look at the water stones queue there's hardly anyone there there's like one two three like let's say they're a family one two three four four people in water stones queue cute in it <laughs> um what is this one what is that Z Z people go to the zoo i guess if you've got kids at home in it you need some respite as well and then another image of another market so yeah good to see everyone back out again enjoying the english sun and the shops okay anyway that's actually the show episode number three two six thanks so much for tuning in as per usual if it's your first time listening please make sure you like and you subscribe and you hit that notification bell to be notified of some new shows and also leave me a comment down below if you're listening via the podcast app why not leave me a five-star review and share with your friends and i'll see you guys again for another show tomorrow but until then take care be safe sayonara